Have you ever asked yourself the question, who do you call when the police are harassing you? What if you're an activist and need help? Who do you trust enough to ask for help when your car breaks down or when you're being bullied at school or need medical help? What about a terrorist attack or a mass shooting? Well, Cell 411 is a fantastic new app that allows you to issue real-time emergency alerts to your family, neighbors, or friends, to one of them or many, in an instant with the tap of a finger. The emergency alert includes your exact GPS coordinates and your trusted friends will get turn-by-turn -turn directions to your location so they can come and help you in need. You'll be notified of an ETA, who's coming to help you, and when they'll arrive at your location. All this happens within seconds. Cell 411 is changing the way humans are handling emergencies all over the world. And the best thing about it is that it's completely free. It's not dependent on government or decades-old analog telephone networks to function. Whether you're a student, parent, neighborhood watcher, or activist, this app is for you. Give it a try and download it today from GetCell411.com. government lackeys who say you didn't build that are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything everything you do is an a to b conversation and the government should see their way out of it create true free markets by adopting the bipcot no government license the bipcot no gov license allows use or modification of any product service or software except by governments or government agents go to bipcot.org that's bravo india papa charlie oscar tango.org Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on TheSeedsOfLiberty.com and TheConsciousResistance.com. So Peaceful Anarchism is covered by the Bibcot NoGov license. This allows for reuse for anyone except for government and the agents thereof. You can find out more information at Bibcot.org. So today we have, delighted to have Virgil Vaduva. I've been trying to get this guy on for the longest time. <laughs> um, I hope I didn't miss all the, uh, you know, the uh, the fanfare. I hope Cell Phone 101 has not died down yet. <laughs> um, yet. Yeah, hopefully not. Um, but he's coming in from Ohio, but he's not originally from Ohio. Um, he's a volunteerist, um, renaissance man, multi-talented person, information security professional and hacker, among other things. Uh, his website is virgilvaduva.com, and uh, you can also find information on Cell 411 at getcell411.com. So, uh, and you can also uh, follow his work uh, through Facebook. He has a Facebook page, uh, Virgil Vaduva, and then uh, another one, Ohio Open Carry, and then uh, one just for Cell 411, and then another one, this recent one called Truth Voice. So, uh, so yeah, he's from communist Romania. Who uh, you know shares um, is 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 a path that's shared by my wife as well. Um, so I'm very interested to to hear. I love I love interviewing people who come from you know these really harsh uh, you know strict authoritarian regimes because everybody um, I've gotten a couple of, I know a couple of different people who come from like Russia and Romania and you know Hungary and different places like that and 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 I like I like to hear the different stories because for me it paints a nice a bigger picture of how it really was right. So yeah, so I want to talk about that um, as well as how he, how he came to volunteerism, which I assume is related to <laughs> communist <laughs> Romania, and uh, of course cell four one one, and perhaps uh, you know how technology is shaping the future of freedom. So uh, Virgil, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. I uh, I uh, heard you interviewed by Jeff Berwick, and I think did Tom Woods interview you as well? No, he has not. I I wish I would score. Uh, I mean, no offense to you or Berwick or anyone else, but yeah. he has. Tom Woods has a huge following. I don't know yeah. how many listeners, you, but I wouldn't say no to him. I wish I could get in touch with him or his producer or something and have a chance to 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 talk to him. Yeah, yeah, I hope so too. That guy has a big following, and uh, and and you right. know, it didn't happen by accident either. He's really, really uh um skilled you know entrepreneur and marketer with his uh, you know with his uh, podcast and his website so it takes a lot of work to get that many followers but um but yeah so please um uh, get into a little bit about um about your history in in communist romania how it was like 
uh, from your perspective, you know, by the time, well, I guess you left in 92, right? So, in, and it ended in 89, I think it was, right? Sure, sure, uh, definitely. And sorry for the quality of the audio here. Uh, it's, it, like I said, I live out in the country and uh, we, have a, we have very poor internet. It's almost a communist, communist level internet access here. Actually, so, uh, I, actually, before you get into that, I just want to say something interesting. I don't know if you, you, um, you heard this recently, but my wife told me that Romania right now has one of the fastest internet connections in the world. Have you heard, have you heard about this? I heard that. You did? <laughs> I did. I did. And it's fascinating because they are very unregulated. That's what cracks me up. In right. Romania, <laughs> the, the telcos are not as regulated as they are here. So there's an incentive to innovate and create mm -hmm. and pull fiber everywhere. I mean, my family, they live out in the, in a village somewhere in, you know, south of Bucharest and uh, they can order, you know, uh, multi megabit, you know, fiber access to their homes and they still have outhouses in their in their backyard. So it's 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 insane. It's insane the level of internet access they get. And there's there's very heavy and fierce competition. Unlike here where these monopolies like you know AT and T right. and Time Warner, they're encouraged by the government to right. you know to stay as they are. Right. There's no innovation right. at all. Exactly. Yeah. So um, yeah, I'd be happy to talk to you about my my history. So I was born in Romania uh, in the in the seventies and. Um, Basically, I uh, the, the entire time I grew up, I, I uh, more or less I grew up thinking and hoping as I started getting older that someday I'll come here to the U.S. and and be able to pursue you know a better life, more freedom, and the ability to you know have have a good career and make good money and so on. And largely, to be honest with you, that was due to my father, who was an avid listener to uh, radio, uh, to Voice of America and uh, Radio F Europe. Uh, and those are two radio networks that were heavily subsidized by the United States government in an effort to undermine the Eastern Bloc and, and, and the Soviet Bloc, right? Mm. So um, it was very interesting because these radio avenues gave us a lot of, you know, uh, insight into what life in the West was like. You know, there's prosperity. People didn't wait in line you know, for four hours to buy a loaf of bread, for example, or frozen chicken. And um, that was our little window into, you know, what the world is like when uh, freedom, you know, is, is, you know, the door of freedom is open a little bit more. And then, of course, uh, anyone who grew up in the 70s and 80s in Romania remembers Dallas. So, you know, are you familiar with the show Dallas? No, I've never heard it, but I, I, I mean, I've never seen it, but I've heard about it, a little bit about it. Okay. So I don't know how old you are, but Dallas, uh, I'm in my 40s now, I was, and uh, as I was, I was growing up and, and uh, I was a kid, can you hear me? No, I just say I was, I was born in 82. I'm 33. 82. <laughs> okay, so you're, ten, you're about 10 years younger than me. Mm -hmm. So um, Dallas, it's interesting because the commies in Romania, they were not playing any S West, uh, you know, Western shows at all. But for some reason, they allowed it was heavily censored TV. There, there's only two TV stations in the entire country, hmm. and they were playing Dallas. And uh, Dallas was an inter very interesting show in my mind. It was very, ca very capitalistic, so to speak, because you have Jr. He's a ruthless business businessman making all these deals to make money and and get rich and all that, and his family. And you have all these narratives going on where it's basically here's this family and all they want to do is make more and more money and it's shocking because that little show actually was another window to these oppressed Romanians into what life in America supposedly was like of course it's TV you can only get so much of the truth mm. but still it was fascinating right and you know I kind of grew up watching Dallas with my parents talking about who shot JR and all these, you know, storylines that, you know, everyone who's watched Dallas ever, you know, remembers. And um, and really, that's kind of what the, the context for me coming here has been. And eventually, I grew up and, you know, when I, uh, when I turned, uh, what, 18, 19, in 1989, the, the wall came down, as you well know. And uh, the U.S. Embassy in Bucharest, they've decided just out of the blue to start offering student visas to uh, to young Romanians. And I was pretty much, I got very lucky because I was that very first batch of Romanian high school graduates that got approved 
to uh, to obtain a student visa to come to college here in the U.S. Hmm. And uh, I got I was very fortunate in the sense that uh, you know I came here and I kind of you know went to college for a few years and you know met a nice American girl, married her you know, and went through that whole very nasty, you know, as you probably know, immigration process where, you know, your entire private life is turned upside down and inside out, uh, you know, by these government bureaucrats before they grant you this, you know, uh, so-called citizenship, right? But at the time, I didn't know anything better. At the time I was a neocon, you know, I believed, you know, this is the greatest country on earth, you know, the flag, the pledge, all that crap. (laughs) So I was a Rush Limbaugh listener. (laughs) Um, We we all, we all, we all have our sins. Come on. (laughs) We do. Of course, man. And, and it really is. And this is what I usually tell people. Don't be ashamed of your, of your background, right? It's you are who you are today because of this journey, you know, you've been on. Right. So Mm. I'm not going to be embarrassed. Yes. I used to listen to Rush Limbaugh and Rush, you know, We've had our moments. We we kind of learn through you know through that process, and we kind of grow up, and we end up where we are today, right? Because right. of that. So um, yeah, and once I uh, in my senior year in college, I started a business, an internet service provider. This is back in the dial-up days, hmm. and I dropped out of college. The business did really well for a while, and then we ended up selling it to uh, to a competitor. And uh, ever since, man, I've done really, I feel like I've done pretty well with my career uh, doing information security work, engineering and, and architecture type work in the IT world. And then uh, here I am today, you know, 20 some years later. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, politically speaking and philosophically, I've kind of come to be a, an anarchist, so, so to speak, or a volunteerist, a libertarian. Uh, mostly thanks to, uh, you know, uh, shows like Free Talk Live, you know, the guys, you know, Ian and Mark, I don't know if you know them. And, yeah, I, uh, I interviewed Ian, uh, not not Mark though, but Ian's a cool guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah very cool guys. And I, I mostly ran across these guys by accident because I was looking for libertarian uh, type of, you know, talk shows. And, uh, you know, I, I think one day, literally, I just Google libertarian talk show <laughs> and I came up with Free Talk Live and I subscribed to their podcast. And uh, once I started listening to them, I was like, wow, these guys are insane. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think Ian, um, Ian and Mark, both of them are very good at just synthesizing the libertarian philosophy in, in fewer words and just presenting the message in such a way that is appealing and it's substantive and uh, and it, it really you know it really kind of grabs your attention and that's kind of my history really that's kind of how i've come to be here today yeah it's it's interesting when uh you know if i guess when we started along this path you know when uh, when we me when i when i started reading this kind of stuff like rothbard um and uh you know larkin rose and stuff like that and then you know one of the things that crossed my mind was like you can say that <laughs> or you can look at things like that, you know? And, uh, and, right. then, and, and so it's a shock in the beginning because, you know, you're so not used to thinking in those terms, but then after, after a while, after the shock factor wears off and, you know, you, the emotions wither away, then you're like, you know what? This makes sense. This is logical. This is rational, you know, yes. freedom works, yeah. you know, <laughs> Go ahead. you're absolutely right. And Rothbard was actually the turning point for me as well. Well, I had a friend of mine. I was in this weird transition period where I was very disenchanted with the Republican Party, and there's no way in hell I was going to j- jump to the Democrats. And I was looking at the Libertarian Party, uh, and and you know, as, as a former you know, commie, commie, you know, someone coming from Romania, I, I'm very, very active. You know, at least I used to be very active in politics. I even ran for office here in Ohio. You know, I, I, I'm not the kind of guy to where I sit back and observe. I'm not a lurker. I'm not, you know, I, I'm not the guy to sit back. And I've always wanting to, you know, I've always been an activist. Even in Romania, I used under communism. I mean, we set things on fire, certain communist buildings. And, you know, we we did some hmm. crazy things, me and my friends. We, I've always been a contrarian to some extent. And when I came here, that that streak in me kind of continued so once I ran across Rothbard and I started reading the Anatomy of, of the State, you know, and a few other of his of his essays and books, that was really the turning point for me because, you know, as an engineer, 
I'm very logical. I'm very, you know, method, you know, my methodology is to just logically analyze uh, anything or any problem, come up with a solution. And then, you know, Rothbard uh, is very good at, at logically following through, you know, a thread. And, uh, you know, it was a home run for me. You know, that was a turning point for me. And that's when I, you know, run across Free Talk Live and so on. After that was, it's all history. But, um, you know, that's kind of what brought me to libertarianism. Ultimately, it, it, it was Rothbard. And I never heard of Larkin Rose, you know, until, you know, a, a while later, you mm-hmm. know, uh, Molyneux. And, and I didn't know who any of these guys were. Mm-hmm. And then I didn't even know what the Free State Project was until probably years after I read Rothbard. Because, you know, I didn't care about what any of these guys. I was just focused on at least understanding the message. So once I got past these questions of who's going to build the roads mm-hmm. and who's going to protect us, <laughs> uh, then I came around fully and I finally, you know, got the, you know, what the message of liberty is all about. Yeah, Larkin Rose did a great uh, rant. You know, he does these little rants. Uh, uh, used to be daily rants, so now they're kind of more like weekly rants, but he still calls them daily rants. <laughs> but, okay. um, but um, uh, yeah, the, the topic was about that idea, you know, how... How a lot of status, you know, they they uh, when they ask, you know, who's going to build the roads, who's going to take care of the poor, who's going to you know take care of the sick and the elderly and you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, usually, what they're doing is deflecting, moving the goalpost, right, changing the subject because they don't want to face uncomfortable realizations like you can't delegate a right you don't have, like taxation is theft, <laughs> like right. you know you know the uh, the belief in authority is a lie right the, you know like things like that um or you know or yeah anything like that you you know it's it's uncomfortable for people to think of these simple things um so they kind of try to uh you know project these um really extravagant you know ridiculous and also irrelevant um scenarios and they really right. don't they really don't matter right it's like it's like if you don't know how the cotton will be picked without chain without slaves, does that mean it's okay to enslave people? <laughs> right. There, there's I, I totally get it. There's a certain level of comfort uh, in in having been in a communist country, having lived in a communist country for almost twenty years. There's a certain level of comfort, and I hate to say this, in the ignorance and in this complacent place, really. Uh, as a human being where you you look at the state as uh, this entity as someone or some group of people that uh, you know are going to take care of you right. i've experienced that myself because you know even even when i was a neocon here in the us i remember thinking you know it's great that we have this government that has a great military power to to protect us and keep us safe mm. Well, we all know very well that's bullshit, right? These people are not <laughs> protecting us. They don't care about They don't give a crap about you. They don't give a crap about me. They're not there to protect us. They're just protecting their masters. Yes, indirectly, we may reap some, you know, weird benefits. You know, if if we go to war, if we, and I'm using we as the United States, this country goes to war with someone else, maybe, you know, me living in, in the Midwest here, I get some additional protection because I live... 20 miles away from some big Air Force base and so on. But that's not, you know, that that's not philosophically sound. That's not a philosophically sound position to hold when you defend the state. That's not, that should not be a reason for me to, to point a gun at you and take your money and call it taxation and, you know, and so on. So right. uh, I remember even the same uh, similar topic when I was discussing uh, immigration with people. This was years and years ago. When uh, soon after I got married and I was, you know, we were struggling with attorneys and paying thousands of dollars to these people to for me to get my citizenship because I was borderline being deported. Right. Hmm. And um, I, I my student visa expired and I was ready to get kicked out of the country. And um, and I remember thinking, wow, if I'm going through this, why would someone else have it easy when they come here? They should experience the same pain. And of course, that's insane thinking. That's like mm. slave on slave mentality. But at the time, I didn't know any better. So you're right. The state lends itself to to weak minds and, and, and ignorant people and, and folks who are uh, just avoiding this, you know, an effort to think and, and, and you know, um, and and just make an effort into you know improving the world, so to speak. Because uh, ultimately, man, I mean, if you're thinking that roads are the you know uh, you know asphalt or concrete roads 
are the height of human evolution, we would not be flying. <laughs> there would be no airplanes flying in the skies, you know? Uh, so, so yeah, the government, <laughs> government and road building, uh, if that's the most we can hope for, or uh, we're in trouble as human beings. <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, yeah, it's like it's like we you know, you have no it's a, it's a broken window fallacy. You know, the government is one giant broken window fallacy. It's like it's right. like it's not like you, you can look at, you know, the White House and the IRS building and you know all these government buildings and say, "Look at that, isn't that and public school and look at all these public schools. Isn't that wonderful? We have all these things because of government?" No, the real question should be what what, what possible inventions and creations and businesses were destroyed because of the right. funding that was stolen from the productive people to build those things. And that's right. the real tragedy. <laughs> you never get to see it, that. It part. really is. It really is. You never get to see it. You never get to see the opportunities lost as a result of the state taking, you know, by force all these all these funds from people. And in essence, just giving them to large corporations, because that's what's happening mm. uh, today in this country. A, 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 I mean, huge majority of the of the money taken from citizens uh, are simply just redistributed to large corporations in exchange for mostly weapons. And, uh, you know, who knows what kinds of, you know, other, you know, government type of services that right. Right, so, only benefit you. So, so in an effort to um, out-compete, because I think uh, I saw a great meme uh, today. It's like, it's like um, you know, in response to, you know, how, how would we live without the government or, or how would we abolish the government? You know, or, I don't really like to say abolish because it's just a like belief in authority. But, you know, how would we live without the state? Well, the same way that we live without Blockbuster, the fax machine and cord <laughs> and the cord phones. That's the same, the same way. <laughs> We're just going to evolve right. past it. Right. You don't have to destroy right. anything. You don't have to like destroy. Like it's like it's like saying we have to, you know, um, you know, storm the white house and drag the president out and lynch him and crucify him. no <laughs> it's like it's like saying like the problem is santa claus or the problem is easter bunny no <laughs> the problem is in the people's minds so that's why i love what you're doing yeah. with the cell 411 is you are actually out competing uh the monopolized police law enforcement uh we're, we're beating them at their own game it really is and and you've said it very well it it it, it, it all is about a paradigm shift. And the paradigm we currently are in is this this world that we live in, the, 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 the ideas that people have in their ha heads that the government is there to protect them. And personal safety, I mean, technically think about it. We've all evolved as human beings over millions and millions of years, however long it, it took us, you and me, at this moment in time, talking on Skype, we are here because... Us and our ancestors have been so good at surviving and being safe without getting killed by everything who wants to kill them in, in this world. We are here because of that. Survival and safety is what we long for most as human beings, as animals and, 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 and humans. And that is in our very, very fiber of our being. That is what drives us to survival. And I think the state... And these government bureaucrats, that's the – well, the, the nasty, disturbing, beautiful thing about this, the state is that they've managed to turn that into this controlling, into, you know, into the chains that are around people's necks today. That's how they use fear-mongering. They use the, the fear of terrorism and ISIS and you know, the Russians or whoever. You name it. There's mm -hmm. always someone that you know, is, is ready to kill you and me, but the state is there to save us. So they've used this, this paradigm time to control us but the great thing is i think and this is why they hate guns this is why they hate self-defense because once human beings understand that hey we are responsible for our own safety i'm responsible for keeping my family safe you're responsible for keeping your children your family safe once people understand that their safety is in their own hands and in the hands of their communities their neighbors people next door that's when the paradigm kind of falls apart because Humans are understanding that nobody in Washington cares about them. Nobody's going to, you know, some politician is not going to show up at your house if a burglar breaks in at midnight. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Cops are not going to be here. Cops are patrolling or, you know, sleeping in their car somewhere. <laughs> so I think I think this is why cell phone on one is, is appearing, at least at this point in time, to, to work. Um, it's because it's kind of, you know, destroying this last paradigm 
that the government is is holding over our heads, the idea of personal safety. And once we put this this idea of personal safety back into the hands of the masses, back into the hands of the people, empower the people to take that that power back uh, and understand that, you know, hey, I am responsible for my community, for my neighbors and my family and in my home. Uh, the government suddenly becomes irrelevant. What is the purpose of government once that, you mm -hmm. know, that fear is removed? Uh, what, what is, why do we need government after all? So I think cell 411 will be a winner because of that. And I've already seen it uh, um, in countries like South Africa, where the government has completely failed to provide safety, even the most basic safety for citizens. Uh, there are hundreds of apps similar to cell 411. We have the best because, you know, the features we have and so on. There are other competitors that are kind of eh, <laughs> trying to do the same thing. But, um, uh, man, we're doing really well. And South Africa is a great proofing ground hmm. for what the future holds. Because in, in the United States, uh, you know, I see a future where, you know, same things are going to happen. You know, the police is going to fail to protect people. Violence is probably going to escalate. All we need is a is a very small economic disturbance in the economy here. You know, food to to run. You know, short food shortages and so on. Uh, can you imagine this country? You know, where the economy collapses and the dollar you know crashes. Mm -hmm. It's going to be chaos. Everyone has a gun, and it's you know it could be you know all out war. Mm -hmm. And a tool like Cell Four on One would be priceless in the hands of the folks. You know, to organize and and plan and and react. So I think this is why it's it's going to do really well, and uh, I think it's been fairly successful so far. We've only been around for technically just a, you know four months or so, uh, and in four months we managed to get about fifty three, fifty four thousand users. Nice. So you know it's exciting, and my goal is to have a million users by the end of twenty seventeen, and and I think we're on track to uh, you know to get to that million users. So, so for now, it's uh, it's free, right? Free download. Will that will it stay that way? That's right. The app will always be free. We uh, when we released version one last year, which to me that was just a beta. Um, I was I was trying to find because this is just a personal project to me, more mm -hmm. or less. It has been up up until recently, mm -hmm. and you know I, I kept pumping money into it. You know it's expensive to hire developers. You yeah, know yeah. you're talking about basically hiring two full time people and paying them out of my salary. Wow! And uh, we're just scraping by. At least we have been. Right. And um, I tried a ninety nine cent you know model you know per download, and that didn't work very well. People. We live in an economy where, you know, the millennials, you know, and, and most folks who use the who use mobile apps on a regular basis, they expect free apps. <laughs> and we are trying we're trying to kind of build this model where we give people a free app, they can use a lot of features for free, but then maybe build a corporate model on top of that or tons right. of other professional type of features and monetize it that way. But I don't think we're you know, we're ready for that just yet for prime time, although we have some really cool stuff coming up soon. So it's going to be exciting. Have you had any, uh, like, I'm sure you've, you've got like, like angel investors and like, I, I think did Jeff Berwick offer to, to help you out with the um, Jeff Berwick? Yeah, I've had some really interesting conversations with them uh, and they're still ongoing, you know, to some extent. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm definitely willing to work with Jeff as well if things work out. But uh, we did have one angel investor. He invested about two hundred and or two hundred and some thousand dollars, almost wow. a quarter million. Nice. Um, yeah, he's he's from Europe, which is great because we don't have to deal with uh, you know all the you know financial market regulators here in the U.S. So mm. that that worked out really well. And uh, his investment really helped us a, a couple of months ago to just kick it up another notch. Basically, I have four full time you know full time developers working for me now. I mm -hmm. can focus a lot more on development and, and marketing and pushing the app out. And mm -hmm. we've been kicking ass. I mean, we've put out <laughs> uh, version three just two weeks ago. I don't know if you had a chance to take a look at it, but uh, we have a new UI. Uh, we have a brand new live video streaming uh, you know, engine in the app. So you can live, live stream video if you want, if you have an encounter with cops and mm -hmm. so on. And, uh, and now we're ready to release a full integration with Facebook to where – you know, people's emergency alerts will be posted to their Facebook walls. And also, we're going to uh, soon announce the uh, release of a small hardware 
uh, panic button that you can actually clip on your belt hmm. and you pair it up with your app. So, you know, if you're in an emergency or if cops are harassing you, all you have to do is just press the button on your belt or on your wrist and uh, alerts go out to, you know, thousands of people if you so want. So it's hmm. we're uh, we're heading in a very cool direction here. And of course, the future, we're talking about, you know, entire fleets of drones that can come and help you if you need help. So wow. <laughs> we have some really, really cool futuristic ideas on, on where to take this. So it's exciting. Wow, that's really awesome. Um, so I, I'm, I'm just curious. So uh, so with the streaming, um, like like it goes directly to where? It's the Facebook wall or it downloads somewhere else like on a, on a website or something? Where's the, where's the video go? Yeah, so so the, the video streaming we're using, uh, it, it's... We're using servers distributed. Basically, our videos, uh, video servers are hosted with AWS, which is Amazon Web Services, and uh, they're distributed all over the world. We have a handful of servers on each major major continent, so that way, someone in India doesn't have to stream all the way to the United United States. They stream in uh, Mumbai or Singapore, for example. Same same thing for Australian users. Hmm. That way, uh, you know the latency for traffic is much much lower mm. so you get much better quality video and then once the videos are streamed all your friends who were watching the video live they can actually download it to their own devices so if let's say you have a really bad inter you know in uh, uh, interchange with a cop right mm -hmm. uh, the cop decides to beat you up you get that on video uh, they will not be able to basically erase the, you know, the the, the footage from your phone. Uh, all your friends will already have it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's fully distributed, so it's impossible to erase evidence. For example, so we've built it like that on purpose because cops are known, are notorious for you, you know, opening people's phones, right. deleting evidence, right. you know, erasing videos that make them look bad. So basically, from the beginning, I've tried to build this into a platform for activists. People that are regularly, you know, involved in interactions with police or neighborhood watching and, and things like that. And it kind of slowly over time evolved into what it is today and it's gonna continue to evolve into, you know, things that are better and better every every with every release. You know, one feature that really got me laughing when I found out about it was the uh you know, when when you're taking a video, I think it's like um uh press this button if you want to delete the video. <laughs> right? And then what it, yeah. ta it takes a picture yeah, so of the, the user. Fake, <laughs> the fake delete uh the fake delete uh, feature. Yeah, that's that's actually specifically there for cops because yeah. once you enable that they can go delete it. It's a it it doesn't actually remove the footage. Right. It, it tricks you to thinking that and it takes a picture of who's trying to to delete it. So uh, oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I love that that kind of stuff. Wow. So 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 the video gets downloaded on, onto like all your people in your network through the cell four one one app, I assume, right? Is that yes. That's how it works. Yes. Yeah. So it'll be stored on a server until the live stream is done and then users can actually download it by, you know, manually. You can tap on a download Nice. Button it gets downloaded to your device and uh, and it becomes basically impossible to remove. So uh, that's yeah. I, uh, I I use you know every time I travel you know I always use Waze uh, you know for for maps, but it's wonderful because it has this you know the network of of you know of users that you're you're kind of interacting with and you you know they right. alert, they alert you know you and you alert them and it's just it's just an awesome thing and. Uh, and and I, I I kind of made it into a game because I'm you know I homeschool my kids I'm, I have a six year old boy and a four year old girl and we're in the car and you know we're we're listening to the GPS and then it and it says it says police ahead <laughs> and so right. I tell my kids all right all right kids road pirate can anybody spot the road pirate <laughs> and so I make it into a game so, and then they're like I awesome. see the road pirate I use I use ways. <laughs> I use Waze almost daily because I have a fairly lengthy commute uh, to my office. Right. So uh, I'm very familiar with Waze. Unfortunately, Google, they do not have an open access to their API for Waze, which is really unfortunate because I would love to hmm. integrate cell four on one with Waze. But Google uh, doesn't allow, allow that, unfortunately. Really? So, oh, wow. So, yeah, so, so what kinds of features bad. would you want to incorporate? Like, is it like those kind of like, the, like a map type feature? Yeah. So, so things like, you know, locations of, of cops, you know, that would be great oh, because what right. would happen is yeah. if you're driving and uh, let's say you drive within half a mile of a, of a cop's location or yeah. an accident, for example, right. you could get an alert instantly and, and know, hey, we're, you're within half a mile of a, of a police officer or an right. accident. And, right, you right, know, right. Be careful and so on. 
so there's a lot of there's a lot of positive things that we could get from Waze, but Google decided to close the close the API and not not give us access, which is fine. We can develop our own. Yeah, not oh, a problem. So, so you're gonna try to do this, you're trying to, you're gonna try to do the same thing like yourself. Just we're going to, to do. There will be a little bit of over, overlapping there. We're gonna introduce a feature soon where we can drop drop a pin on a map for nice. known police, you know, stakeout areas where. Right. You know, you, we can start actually geotagging certain locations where cops are known to lurk. Yeah. So that way, if you're an activist or, you know, I've been very open about the fact that I would love people in the black market. If you're a drug dealer or, you know, whatever you're doing, if you're weed, s selling weed on a street corner, I would love for you to use cell 401 to stay safe. And, uh, mm. you know, I have no qualms about that. And and I think that knowing where, where cops are located and, you know, lurking and trying to harm people. You know, peaceful people that are just selling a joint or giving a joint to a friend. Right. You know, people should be able to use the app to stay safe from police officers. One incident I read about in Mexico and and cell four one one. We're actually building a Spanish version of it right now. Mm. Uh, in Mexico, cops notoriously abuse women when they arrest them, and mm. um, you know, a lot of cops are actually hand in hand working with the drug cartels. Mm. So there are kidnappings and murders and women are getting raped when they're arrested and, and sent to jail. Mm. It's terrible, terrible mm. situation. And we're actually speaking with a, uh, uh, with a director from Hollywood right now. He's ready to release a uh, documentary on the, on the kidnapping market in Mexico. And uh, he's reached out to us and asked us about potentially partnering up. And we're still in discussions with him about uh, releasing a version of the app to help, you know, those folks in Mexico out. So, there are so many ways. Um, another example is Mozambique. Mozambique has uh, actually a guy from the UN, from the United Nations, <laughs> reached out to me hmm. because the UN is so bad at keeping track of people. They have uh, they have doctors and physicians and volunteer volunteer nurses in Mozambique. They're there to help people uh, who are sick. Right? This is a medical uh, establishment. Mm -hmm. And they're so bad at knowing where to go to find people that they actually reached out to me. They said, "Hey, is it a is there a possibility that you know you could build a light version of the app so that it runs on really old devices or really old versions of Android? Because so many of these pregnant women out there, like uh, something like one out of five pregnant women die in childbirth in Mozambique hmm. because wow. they cannot get doctors, they, they don't have clean environments, and so on." They, get infections and so on. It's a really bad situation. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I don't have a problem working with these folks. So there's a huge potential. There's a huge market out there for helping people, basically. And uh, and right now, that's my goal. I don't care about making money off of this right now. There's plenty of time for us to, uh, to find out ways to monetize this app. And there's plenty of ways to do that. But right now, my main concern is let's get it in the, ha the hands of as many people as we can. Uh, divorce, encourage these people to divorce themselves from the from the government and from the state and dependencies on the state, encourage them to depend on their neighbors and their families and their friends. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how we really slowly change the world. This is huge, in my opinion. And I'm not saying that just because I created this project. Mm -hmm. But to be honest with you, look at Uber, man. Uber's valuation right now is over $60 billion dollars. And it's so ridiculously stupid because all Uber is <laughs> is just an app that lets people put you know puts people in touch with each other for a stupid car ride somewhere. <laughs> to me, I mean that's mm. all Uber is. Yeah. And to me, you know, for that company to be worth sixty billion dollars, it's mind blowing. <laughs> and here we are, you know, not every human being on this planet needs a car ride. <laughs> <laughs> but <Right>. every human <laughs> being on the planet, every human needs to feel safe and needs to be, you know, everyone needs safety and wants to feel safe. So uh, honestly, I think we can change the world in a much more real way than Uber has changed the world. Uh, the key is, is how we are going to get there. And right now we're running on, you know, on a very small budget. And mm. I'm hoping one of these days we're going to find the right investors and connect with the right people that can push us to the top and and you know kick us into really high gear to where we can you know we can get our hands on this project and really change the world but i think we're on the right track it's i'm very excited about it do you, do you guys also have like a patreon or a crowdfunding or a kickstart or anything like that no no i tried to do something on uh, on one of these kickstarting uh, websites and uh it was a, a miserable failure we only raised like six six hundred bucks or something like that so mm. uh but you know 
we are good. I think we are financially we're we're okay for at least another year and a half. Okay. Uh, I'm not really concerned. I think we can. We have plenty of time to get the app to where I want it. I want to see it, mm. and and I think we have. Uh, we're gonna be year year and a half, two years. It's plenty of time for us to find some uh, you know some more investments and uh, and kick it up you know to the next notch. So I'm excited. Yeah, what what this this uh, you know this app and this conversation reminds me of is the the famous Buckminster Fuller quote of um, you know you don't change the system by by attacking it but by creating new systems to make the existing system obsolete. Exactly, <laughs> right. And this is what I've been telling people in in, in Romania under communism, um, people have over decades of living in this oppressive communist world. We've learned that living a subversive lifestyle is much more powerful mm. and much more damaging to the system than going up in the streets and yelling at people and throwing, you know, firebombs and Molotov cocktails and <laughs> or shooting cops or, you know, you are going to undermine the system and bring it to its knees much faster if you live a subversive lifestyle uh, rather than just, you know, uh, firing bullets mm -hmm. at people. So, uh, I usually try to encourage my anarchists and libertarian friends to pursue subversive lifestyles, you know, grow your own food, live independently, stop paying taxes if you can, do the best you can to just, you know, screw the system over mm -hmm. and eventually it'll come to an end. And, you know, a lot of my friends look at me like I'm crazy when I talk about these things. But man, I've already lived through one revolution. You know, I've seen people run over tanks right in front of me and mm -hmm. I've seen, you know, people shot in the streets and, um, you know, and often, you know, I tell people, look, I didn't, you know, I've already done that. I didn't come to this country to do that again, honestly. And if you guys cannot fight for your own freedom as Americans, I'm not going to do it for you, <laughs> you know. Mm. And uh, it's it's on you guys to to find your own ways and your own revolution if you're looking for a revolution. Uh, you know, but like Ian Freeman likes to say on, on Free Talk Live, let's aim for an evolution rather than a revolution. And let's exactly. evolve yeah. into what we want to be next and what, you know, create this world that we want to live in yeah so, yeah you're yeah. right definitely yeah well said i mean uh, you know so many people when i talk about uh you know write about things that i write about and talk about like um you know the immorality of government and statism and laws and regulations and taxes and then and then like all right so i'll get my gun and when should we start the revolution <laughs> I'm like no no calm down <laughs> no it's not like that right so the problem is not in Capitol Hill, right? The problem is not in the White House. The problem is not in the House of Representatives. It's not in the Senate, right? It's not in any state legislature. It's not in any federal agency. That's not the problem. The problem is in the people's minds, right? Because in once, their minds and hearts. Right. Once they stop legitimizing it and accepting it and approving of it and paying into it, it, it just collapses like a house of cards. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. I, I see that every day. I'm amazed at how willing Americans are to send their children to these prisons that they call schools. We homeschool. We have four children. We homeschool them all. I would never, I would die before I send them to, to, to government schools. Uh, but 97 percent of the population out here, they love their government schools. These are indoctrination camps. Right, right. They love the schools. They right. love, you know, hearing about children being forced to say the Pledge of Allegiance. They love all this garbage, man. Mm. They love paying, paying taxes. They love their military, their cops. Mm. Yeah. You know, just the other day, there was something that, uh, where did I see this? I think it was uh, Panera. Oh, no, it's a, it's a uh, King's Island. It's a, uh, it's, it's a park, like an amusement park here, not far from us, where they they had a free police and fireman day, you know, and these are like $60 tickets. And I was uh, thinking, wow, holy crap, why? It would be a great day to put a, you know, fuck the police shirt and walk around, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? But, right. Uh, but it's, you know, why? Why would you want that? Panera has on Wednesdays, you know, uh, free soup for cops and firemen. I mean, mm. I understand firemen because they actually do something to some extent. But cops, you know, why would... You right. know, cops get free coffee where everywhere they go. Right. The Americans love love their slave masters, you right. know, and and uh, it's not things are not going to change until uh, you know their minds and their hearts are going to change. Right, that's the epitome of Stockholm syndrome. And I saw the um, I saw one uh, article of of this one business. Uh, I guess it was like a cafe, and uh, I, and he put like a, a sign outside which says "No government employees." are welcome <laughs> <laughs> and there was a cop that actually came in and he and he he said i'm sorry sir but you're making the customers nervous please leave 
and the cop <laughs> the cop left. He didn't make a big problem with it. And then he was being interviewed by some some news uh, agency, and he was like, "I know, I just I, just, I don't like them to be inside," <laughs> you know, which That's is awesome. awesome. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? So uh, again, yeah. if more businesses would do something like that. I think things would change as well. They would. They would. I think if more people took a stand against government abuse and government bureaucrats. Uh, uh, things would change. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I agree. But, uh, but yeah, it's definitely a reflection of people's uh, 12 years of indoctrination. I mean, is it a coincidence you go to government school for 12 years and then you come out supporting government? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> it's too much of a coincidence. So. I, someone somewhere, yeah, someone somewhere figured out that this works. The indoctrination camp work. And it's funny because I spent 12 years in communist schools and it completely backfired on me. So uh, <laughs> on them, because right. I did, I never believed into any of their stuff. Right. But I think honestly, most people did not. And this is communist Romania. What is scary is that here actually people believe that garbage. They really buy into it. Right. We didn't buy into communism in Romania. We knew it was, it was empty of any value. It was mm. all lies. Mm. It was all crap crap but here actually people when people pledge allegiance to a flag here man they mean that you mm -hmm. know try to go to some uh, government official you know business when they say the pledge try to like not stand up or stand up and turn your back to the flag Ooh. see what happens Woo! You're talking. You're, you may they, even get a beat down, man. They, they're gonna. They're, they're um, gonna. They're gonna. Um, as you say, bury you in logical, rational arguments about. <laughs> no, yeah, right. <laughs> about why statism makes sense. No, that's impossible. <laughs> right. Right. So that's what's disturbing about this country because you know uh, people really mean that stuff here. You know they love. I mean, people mm. cry about their flags. They get tears in their eyes. They. <laughs> You know, the government has figured out a way to, you know, to brainwash them in such a way that, you know, literally people will die for their flag. So it's it's crazy. Yeah, yeah it's really amazing. Um, but I, I don't want to keep you any longer. Um, I know you have your kids to get back to. Uh, so please <laughs> let let my audience know uh, where they can find you. Just plug your your pages again um, if they want to sure. fo follow your work. Yeah, if you wanna if you wanna check out Cell Four One One, go to getcell 411com You can download the app there. You can read about it. There's an FAQ on the site. Uh, explain it explains kind of how the app works and what it, what it actually does. Go to virgilvaduva.com. There's a contact form on the page, or just email me to uh, you know vivaduva v v a d u v a at gmail.com. I respond to emails very quickly. Or check me out on Facebook. I I'm fairly uh, you know reachable guy. The reason I you and I haven't been able to stay in touch very well lately is because I've been uh, my Facebook account has been suspended for the last thirty days uh. Uh, over some uh, I don't even know over what who knows I say controversial stuff all the time it's impossible <laughs> to know uh, to know what happened or who complained about something I've posted so. Uh, you know, Facebook is very good at uh, at, at uh, listening to people that are easily offended. So we'll see. <laughs> you just you just you know, guilty, you're, my... you're guilty of hate speech. What can I say? You know, we're all <laughs> probably. <big. laughs> why do you why, why do you... someone somewhere thought I was hating them? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why why do you hate the poor? Why do you hate <laughs> why do you hate women, Virgil? Come on. <laughs> yeah, I, I know, right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, wonderful so. conversation. Um, so, so actually, before before you go, I usually ask all my guests, "What is your favorite quote of all time?" Oh man, I that's a that's a tough one. Um, so, I have a tattoo on my uh, on my thigh. Actually, I have I have tattoos all over the place, but I have one that I designed <laughs> myself, which is the anonymous logo, uh, surrounded by you know uh, the uh, you know some some phrasing. And uh, and I have two two phrases around it. One is six emperor tyrannis, which, as you well know, is you know, and thus unto tyrants. That's what it means in Latin. Mm. And the second one is carpe noctem, which is a play off carpe diem. You know, you know the famous carpe diem: mm. seize the day. You mm. know, don't don't postpone things. Just do things today. Seize your day and get stuff done. And you know grow and all that. And and to me, you know, carpe noctem: seize the night is such. You know, it carries so much more power because it lends itself to what I was saying earlier, which is really subversive living. Hmm. You know, just live subversively, seize the night. <laughs> you know, live live in the shadows, and and you know, you can you can instill change around around you and in you know in the world uh, in a very powerful way. You know, just 
just by seizing the night. So <laughs> that's, that's kind of my favorite quote, I guess. And I don't know where it came from. I don't know if I made it up or not. Maybe I've read it somewhere and, mm -hmm. you know, and I remembered it, but it's on my skin. So it, it's really important to me. <laughs> that's great. That's awesome. Actually, that kind of reminds me of, uh, you know, when people who are really, really productive, you know, and then and and they sleep very little, and they're like, "I'll sleep when I'm dead." <laughs> that's, that's, that's right. Kind of, that's kind of that's the night. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's the night. It's like that's such wasted hours. Like eight, <clears throat> I can get eight more hours done of work. Why would I want to waste it sleeping? <laughs> it's so inefficient. <laughs> I know, man. I know. I'm I'm a really I'm not a morning guy. I love sleeping, but I'm I've noticed as I'm getting older, I have I have problems sleeping in. So I'm noticing that I'm sleeping less. Unless I don't know if that's a symptom of getting getting older or not. Maybe it is, but uh, in some ways it's a good thing. In some other ways, it's not because I'm tired all the time. <laughs> so uh, as you as you get older, in about ten years, you'll see. <laughs> <laughs> it's the price. It's the price for being a productive and industrious individual. <laughs> well, I, well, I thank you very much for the magnificent thank conversation. You. And uh, for everything that you're doing with this with this uh, app, because I think you're really making a big difference in uh, many people's lives, especially in South Africa, um, you know, where things like this are sorely needed. Um, so, yeah, this is how you change the world. You know, you um, you go out there and you do things to the best of your ability. You create you see, you know, where um, things are deficient in the world. You know, who is suffering? Why are they suffering and what do they need to alleviate their suffering? And you provide it to them, and uh, and, and that, I think that's how that's how we have lifted ourselves out of the dark ages. Um, although I still think we still have a little bit more lifting to go, but <laughs> you're definitely, I think, you're doing yeah. a great job. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I think we are just in the very first. I mean, think about it. You know, electricity has only been around for a hundred and some years. You know, invented and mm. discovered, and you know, transportation and so on. I mean, we've technically only been civilized as human beings for only 150, 200 years, maybe. Mm. So we are just at the very beginning of human evolution, of true human evolution. So I think we are, we are the, the pioneers, the early pioneers of, you know, that we have on our shoulder the responsibilities of, of take, just taking the world in a new and better direction, hopefully. And, and maybe in 5,000 years from now, maybe we'll, will live out there in the universe and look back and be able to say, man, you know, humanity has really made it, you know, there's no more government and people are living freely and, and people have figured out how to get along and so on. But who knows? Who knows what the future holds? But uh, like I said, we're, this is just the beginning. I'm hoping that, you know, the world will only get better from here. And I think it will. Yeah, yeah, I definitely think it's a one-way street to freedom, and uh, volunteerism is a boat that everyone needs to get on. <laughs> and it, totally, it, it's a great, uh, great quote that I, I like to think about, which, uh, which is every society, um, <clears throat> uh, it's like every society uh, reveres its conformists and um, and kind of destroys its troublemakers, <laughs> or yeah, you know, something like that. You know, that's unavoidable. <clears throat> Yeah, so so it's uh, you know we I think uh, you know people like you what, doing what you're doing you know your your um, the value that you're providing may not necessarily be realized now the full extent uh, unfortunately it's like maybe we won't see a voluntary society you know in my lifetime or your lifetime but hopefully for my kids my grandkids you know um, that's what we're, that's why Agreed. we're doing this you know so it's wonderful Agreed. but um, awesome conversation uh, Virgil thank yeah. you very much. Um, so if anyone, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoy talk talking to you, and it's it's been an awesome talk. Absolutely. Yes, thank you very much. So if anybody wants to uh, to donate to me, you can do so through uh, Bitcoin, um, Patreon. That's patreon.com slash peaceful anarchism, or you can use the uh, the Amazon affiliate links on my website uh, to um, buy your buy your products through Amazon at no extra cost to you. I get a, a small commission from that, and uh, and you can help me. Uh, interview fascinating people like Virgil here, which I love doing. Uh, as we know, you know, through uh, through capitalism, you know, we all respond to incentives. So if you like what I do, you know, please provide me monetary compensation if you enjoy it. Value for value, it's the uh, the capitalist way, right? That's how you make. That's why. That's how you see Absolutely. more things of what you love in the world is by patronizing it, right? So, uh, so awesome conversation. Thank you very much. So this is take care. This is peaceful anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and the Seeds of Liberty dot com and the Conscious Resistance dot com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Take care.
Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.